We had seen in the previous videos that there are four stress types defined in the code visually sustained stress, occasional stress, flexibility stress, and operating stress. Before Appendix P got the later in 2014 version of B31.3. Of the four stress types, sustained and occasional stress are on one side, which is addressed by the collapse mode of failure, while expansion and operating stress are on the other side, which is focused on fatigue rather than shake. Today, I'll discuss about the shakedown, the elastic shakedown. Unlike ratcheting, whose limits include primary non-cyclic loadings combined with the secondary cyclic loadings, the shakedown limits only uses the cyclic repeated loadings. Also, as we know that the self-limiting stress does not cause the abrupt cross structural deformation when it reaches the ill strength of the pan. Therefore, if allowed by fatigue, the stress range can exceed the ill strength of the material because cold allowable and the hot allowable, that is SC and SH, may be as high as two thirds of the ill strength. However, it is anticipated that the piping system will shake down to elastic behavior if the stress range is within the limit. So, how does for the cyclic loading the piping system actually shakes down? In order to explain this, we need to transverse on the path of a stress-strain curve for a restrained system which is assumed to be elastic till its yield point and is perfectly plastic when the deformation or yielding starts. On the stress-strain curve of the ductile material, we are already familiarized with the various significant points like the elastic limit, yield stress, ultimate stress and rupture points. So initially, at the installation temperature, let there be no stress and no strain in our strain system. Let this initial startup condition be 0.0. Now, as the strain system heats up gradually, it expands, leading to development in thermal strain, and accordingly, thermal stress sets in. Now, if the system is cooled down gradually below the insulation, temperature starts shrinking, leading to compressive strain and compressive stress establishment due to lowering of the temperature. Thus, what we observe is that the material that being heated or cooled within its large limit, that is between the two points when deformation starts setting in, it comes back to its initial state at the insulation temperature. That is, it remains at zero stress and zero strain condition irrespective of the cycle of thermal loadings performed. Well, this is quite obvious and is pretty suitable for the system operating somewhat equally in the hot as well as in the cold conditions and thus being well placed within its upper and lower limits of deformation or So we can conclude that for the system which are bound to be operating somewhat equally above and below the insulation temperature can operate elastically and without any deformation within maximum of twice that of the yield strength that is the sum of the hot and the cold yield strength. So for the repeated infinite thermal cycle what we see is actually the material is operating in the strength range of value which is twice the absolute strength value. Now we provide a minor shift. Our system will now be intended to be operated only at temperatures above the installation temperature. In such case, let us again start afresh with zero stress and strain condition at the installation temperature. Now, when the system is heated gradually till the yield strength of the material, thermal stress and strain start setting in as previous. Again, when the system is cooled down from the maximum temperature from where the yielding will start, the system retraces its elastic path and reaches the same zero stress, zero strain state and insulation temperature. As I illustrated at this time, operating range for my system is between the installation temperature to the maximum temperature where yielding sets in. The system will be in operating infinitely between the elastic range which is equal to that of the elastic strength of the material. 
So for the same material, our elastic range got fixed to half of the range what we had when the system was allowed to operate below the installation temperature. So are we not underutilizing the material strength, which we have seen is approximately twice that of the yield strength based on its operational ability. Before we conclude anything here, let's perform one more check by being brave enough and letting our material experience temperature which will take it beyond its yield strength. So our restraint system start deforming once the temperature is exceeded and material reach its yield strength. Also as the material being perfectly plastic beyond its elastic limit, these deformations or strains are the permanent ones. They are not too After increasing the temperature beyond TY and having some permanent strain set in a system, let's cool it down. As the system is cooled down, the system follows the proportional path of stress and strain, but with an offset from the initial elastic line. And this offset being equal to the amount of permanent deformation or strain which has crept in into the system. After some time of the cooling process, we reach a state where our restraint system becomes stress-free, but because of being adventurous, there is a plastic deformation or strain set in. Now, as we started with a system without any strain, I want it back, so I will allow further cooling and allow other system to shrink in order to give me back the same system with initial dimensions. Because further cooling is done, compressive stress starts setting in the system. Finally, we arrive at a desired initial geometry, but at the cost of additional strain set in our system. Well, it's okay. We got our system back in shape as it was initially, though it has tended to have acquired some compressive stress, again because of my being adventurous. So again, if I reheat my system to the same adventurous temperature from where I return back and acquiring some deformation, I find that initially when the temperature is getting added to the system, the system first tries to shed off its acquired compressive stress and then advances further unyielded till the yield strength of the material, that is the adventurous temperature. Well, I wish that I could get my same system back at insulation temperature with zero stress and zero strain, but I think I won't be able to get it back ever now in the same initial stress strain state. But again, what I could get is that my system was seeing much higher temperature, that is adventurous temperature compared to TY system and that's okay, I'm happy. I'm making my system operate elastically at higher temperature. And that's better. I am also utilizing bit of compressive yield strength getting induced into my system and that also by not getting unyielded and following the elastic proportional path though it got a bit offset from its original. My elastic path actually shook down from where I started and the moment I became adventurous. Shook down? Yeah, it did. It changed its line of action and it came down parallel to where it was earlier. So that's the elastic shakedown. This is the beautiful property of the secondary stress. The stress which got itself limited to the yield point, allowing the strain in the system to set in without itself getting changed. Secondary stress, the self-limiting stress. Well, advancing further, when we further continue to heat our system till position where it is stress to amount equal to some of the yield strength at cold condition and hot condition, it acquires significant compressive stress when cooled down to the installation temperature. This can be practically demonstrated when I try to unbolt my flange which is bolted in my system. At the start of the thermal cycling, the flange was simply bolted without any strain in it. Now as I unbolt, the flange seems to fly out of the system.
It seemed to self sprung from the attached piping after unbolting as the connected piping had accumulated compressive stress at installation temperature though the strain was zero. Also, the gap got created between the flanges when the line was disconnected. So this ends with the elastic shakedown. Thank you.